All right, we are live. How's everybody doing? I got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to be moving pretty quick. Uh, I ask that you just do your best to keep up. Uh, ask what questions you have as we go. Uh, Brad, I see yours. Um, just real quick on the uh, change tandem compressors. Yeah, uh, I'll leave that one there. But on the solder, uh, I recommend the 56 uh, with flux. So we get what are their uh, pre coated orange flux rods, 56%, do really well with dissimilar metals in general. Uh, so I, that's one that I can recommend. How's the audio coming through? I am kind of curious. Uh, I did actually get a different camera set up and I'm um, just wanting to make sure audio and all that's pristine uh, before I get too deep into this because once I get rolling, I'm going to be pretty honed in. So if somebody would throw me a bone on the audio. Uh, do, 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 do. Audio is good. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, we're going to roll. Uh, a lot of ground to cover. Uh, this is going to be over water-cooled machines, but uh, I'm gonna, there's going to be a heavy emphasis on the centrifugal side. I think that's what really gets people the most, and majority of the water-cooleds that we do work on tend to be centrifugal. Uh, there's all kinds of types. You know, you can have scroll, you can have screw, you can have the centrifugal style. If you don't know what a centrifugal is or if that's a new term for you, just sit tight, you'll find out soon. Um, that being said, we will roll over. I've got a nice little pretty thingamabob here. We're gonna try this out. All right, so this would be a typical, you know, scroll water-cooled machine. You've got your compressors up top. You have your, um, you have the uh, electrical cabinet there and then that black section is going to be your evaporator and your bottom section down there is going to be the condenser so in this case you see the refrigerant is coming in on the end of that bell that is um, that's that means that this is a flooded i'm sorry that would be a dx type evaporator so the water is going to be coming in on the side flanges uh, and then your condenser on that would be a flooded type condenser where the water is inside the tube. So the evaporator, uh, refrigerants in the tubes, the condenser, the water is in the tubes. But that that's a pretty common, I've seen a handful of those around in our area and we've serviced them. So I know that they exist. I'm gonna, and one thing I am gonna note here, there's all kinds of machines out there. There's no way I could possibly cover all of them. So I am gonna specifically hone in on what uh, our team sees in our area and what I would expect you to kind of have a base knowledge of working in our team. Uh, all the extra stuff that we don't really see on a con consistent basis, I'm, I'm not gonna spend much time on. Uh, just kind of giving you some warning there. All right, so the next style machine going on from scroll, you have a screw machine. So in screws, uh, we talked pretty heavily last month about a screw uh, setup, but you can see the uh, you can see the screw there on top. That is kind of a breakdown of what the inside of a screw looks like. I have some uh, pictures coming up where you will see that. So this is another style. Now this is a CHN style compressor. You'd see on like an air cooled. Uh, the, what they put on the water cooled is similar, but it is a, it's a different compressor. It's not exactly the same, but they all function with the same basic principles. So on the uh, front of the compressor where the yellow section is, that is your actual discharge section. You can see your discharge check valve. That's the little circular thing with the white Teflon ring. There in the middle, you have your screw bolts. So you'll see that your female bolt is the one closest to the outside edge there. And your male bolt is the one that is uh, connected to the drive shaft. Uh, there on the other end, uh, furthest from the yellow, I guess it'd be the left end of your screen, you're gonna see that's your actual stator assembly and the rotor. So there's actually two parts there. 
you'll see the kind of a darker gray in the middle and then you'll have this silver kind of shiny shaft. That, that shaft is the actual uh, shaft for the bolt. The darker gray section is the actual rotor for the motor assembly and then the lighter gray on the outer edge is your stator. So to kind of give you a visual example of what a screw would look like. Now again, this is a train example. This uh, picture, this slide here is a train RTHD specifically. Um, there and in our area, I know that we have two that we have serviced. Um, so anyway, may run into some of those. There's not that many screw. Yeah, there's not that many screw water cools in our region. Uh, they definitely exist. There are some smaller ones. Um, but yeah, anyway, moving on. And kind of give you now this picture here is an example of a handbell. Uh, this is an example. This is a style, and we actually have one of these under account where uh, it's, it's built into a built up system. Now, handbells are fairly common retrofit compressors. So, uh, if they've got, uh, so for example, the account we have that has these handbells in the built up system, that system originally had a, um, uh, the, the train, I think it was F series, uh, semi hermetic compressors in it. And, uh, and those were recips. They converted it with the uh, MCS panel to the handbells, and now they run the handbells on that system instead. Uh, it's just a different way of doing the same thing. Screws are more efficient than those recips were. But you can kind of see that on the further right end of the screen. That is your discharge side of that compressor with your uh, uh, oil separator, that kind of yellow ring with a just inside of that picture, that is actually the uh, separator piece of the housing. And then uh, towards the middle of the compressor, at the center of the screen, you can see the screw bolts again. That is your male, your female is on the back side, kind of where you can't see it too well. And then your uh, on the left side of that compressor, you have the um, uh, you have the motor assembly and the rotor, uh, that compressor, both of the compressors we've shown, actually all three of them, all of these are suction cooled machines or compressors. So uh, I think I have, okay, we'll roll into centrifugal. Uh, now I am going to back up. It's all right. So I, I know I'm breezing through this. What I'm trying to do right now is show you the different types and then we'll start to kind of go through a little more detail. So uh, don't get too worried that I'm breezing through some of this. I'm just wanting to uh, get the information in front of you. Going on to the centrifugal. Now, this is a train CVH F series compressor. But what you can see is there's, uh, there's multiple chambers to this. So on the far right side of the screen, you have your um, rotor assembly. So that is the motor, rotor. Uh, it's all... It is all one solid shaft assembly. And then on the middle of the screen, kind of those silver pieces inside of what, you know, would be the compressor housing, those are your impellers. Now, something that train does is they run a low speed operation, meaning that I think theirs are, I always forget, it's 1800 or 3600 RPM. Uh, but each one of those impellers feed into another. So where York and some of the other manufacturers, how they do it is they have one small impeller, but they run it at a high speed. Train does it very differently. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and depict that. So a train CVH series, the two most common we service is going to be a CVHE and CVHF. Uh, let's see. If I, so... With either of these, the difference between the E and the F is the number of compressor stages. So let's see if I can draw this. Get to participate in some art class again. Uh, so just imagine this is your compressor assembly. You've got a divider and compressor housing, or technically your volute. Uh, you've got your suction in bell coming in, and then you've got your PRVs. 
or sorry, IGVs, because it's train. Anyway, uh, as these rotate, this first stage impeller feeds into the second stage impeller, which then feeds out into the condenser uh, down the volute itself. Uh, now the volute is the actual housing around a centrifugal compressor. So when you see the big cone looking thing coming off of it, that is the actual volute that we're referring to. So when you hear that term, it's what that term means. Uh, if you say compressor housing, pretty much everybody would, everybody's gonna understand what you're talking about. But as you get into it, and as you start to talk more technically about these machines and what they do, how they do it, uh, that is a correct term for that. Um, all right. What I want to point out that's very specific here as to how Train does this, and I don't want to breeze over this part, they're, they have very large impellers. And actually, I'll show you one. I got one just sitting right here. This is a Train impeller. Okay. This is a train centrifugal, uh, I forget the size, what is that, 26, something like that. Anyway, it's a very large impeller compared to most. Now, I say large, large in reference to a 400 ton machine, kind of large, not 1,000 plus. So, a, to give you a size example, a York machine might be this inner diameter alone, where the train is, is got considerably more. So what train is doing with this is the refrigerant is coming into this nose piece and it is coming out of the top into the diffuser assembly. And so as it comes out and goes and gets diffused into the volute, it feeds into the next impeller. And so one impeller feeds the next, it comes in here, hence the two stage setup, and then that shoots it out. What this allows train to do is they can run a very slow uh, impeller comparatively, you know, to everybody else. And uh, it, it, it allows them to maintain uh, a higher, or it honestly gives them a pretty high lift ratio. So one of the benefits that Train has over York or Carrier or just about anybody is they can handle a high lift. Uh, the term lift re references the difference between your discharge pressure and your evaporator pressure or your suction pressure. So the difference between there is lift. So a York machine uh, like a YK with a P-series uh, com that's, that's the compressor uh, model. You're probably usually by the time you hit about 60 psi of uh, deferential or, or lift, sorry, 60 psi of lift, you're getting into surge territory. You're going to start to hear the machine uh, stall and go into surge. Now, if I can get down my list far enough, surge is on that on that list. So I'll I'll do my best. Um, the uh, shoot, oh, sorry, train. I've seen trains run as much as 80, uh, 70 to 80 pounds of lift before they start having uh, surging issues, which is honestly pretty incredible for their design. And because they're running a very low speed with large impellers and multiple stages, they're able to carry that lift a lot better. Uh, now, what causes higher lifts is if you are, if you have issues controlling your uh, condenser water temperatures, keeping them low, or if you're running a uh, low pressure machine, which would be in today's standards, uh, 123, uh, there's a handful of other newer ones, one, two, three, four, X, Y, Z, whatever. Uh, I don't have them down by memory, but some of those low pressures, we do still have R11s in our area as well, so you're going to see all the above at that point. Anyway, uh, they can get non-condensables in there, and so when you have those non-condensables, that's going to 
uh, affect your ability to heat exchange and that will lead to uh, higher uh, lift ratios. Um, the, at the same time, if, you, uh, if you're running really low uh, uh, water, um, if you're running really low water set points, chill water set points, so, for, uh, for example, I've got some buildings that I, they try to run a, a 42 degree uh, leaving chill water. When you do something like that, it's very critical that you make sure that your condenser water is under control as well and your building is capable of handling that because what happens a lot of the time is on the really warm and hot and especially humid days when your wet bulb is high, uh, that will that that higher wet bulb is going to lead to higher um, condenser water temperatures, and those higher temperatures are going to obviously raise your your head pressure because those are going to be relative to each other. Water temp goes up, head pressure is going to rise. PT chart that leads to a high lift situation because they can't control the condenser water enough to keep it low enough to keep the lift down. So in those scenarios, you know, sometimes, especially on the really hot days, they have to bump that chill water set point up some so that it raises the evaporator pressure a little bit and we're not cooling it down as much, which reduces our lift enough to get us past that really hot point during the middle of the day uh, until everything starts to kind of cool back down. We can bring the condenser water back down and then we can let everything go back to the way they wanted originally. So uh, that's one of the things that Train, I think, has a, has a really strong advantage in. Now, you have uh, York and uh, TurboCore, which I don't think I have. Maybe I do. Yeah, here you go. Here is a... York design. I don't have a pretty picture of it, but what you're looking at is the uh, is a breakdown of the chambers inside of a P series York compressor. So on the right side of that uh, depiction, you're seeing the suction inlet uh, about you know two thirds of the way up. That's where the refrigerant is coming in. It's hitting the PRV assembly, and then you'll see a little bit of a cone shape in there if you look close enough. That is the impeller. Now, about mid-screen, you see kind of this really grayed out hash looking section. That is your gear assembly that allows us to uh, speed that compressor up. So earlier I said, and somebody may have mentioned it in the comments on the train's RPM. I, th I think they're 3600 RPM for train. A York uh, and, and a York and like Daikin Turbo Core will run, or even Carrier. I think Carrier's in the same ballpark of, in terms of RPM. Anyway, uh, you're talking on the low end around 20,000 RPM, uh, or 15 to 20,000, and then on the high end as much as 30,000 RPM, uh, or maybe even a little more in some cases, depending on the the specific series. So, very stark difference, but again, that impeller is a fraction of the size, literally half the size, if not smaller, than this for the same tonnage machine. We're just talking about, you know, four or five hundred ton machines here. So, uh, in order to achieve, they, they all move the same inevitable amount of refrigerant, and they can process the same amount of BTUs, they just do it different ways. Um, there's advantages to both. One of the things that I see is the York design tends to be more efficient and can handle some pretty unique load scenarios. For example, you could run a York uh, condenser water set point uh, down to 60 degrees on a on a uh, the most recent revisions of the YK series uh, chillers. You can't do that with a train. Trains uh, they need that extra condenser water temperature 
in order to maintain proper oil return. Where with the way that York has designed their machine, uh, which it kind of plays more into the oil design, but the how the compressor runs plays a part in that. Uh, York's version of it allows them to achieve that. Now, why would you want to run 60 degree condenser water? Well, genuinely, what's that do to your lift? Lift is relative, is, a, is directly proportional to uh, compression ratio. So lower lift, lower compression ratio. And when you lower both of those things, it requires less horsepower to turn that impeller. And when you don't need as much energy to turn it, you save cost. So by, you know, we run our uh, YKs down to about 65 degrees in the winter on the condenser water side. Uh, I, I, I could take it to 60, I choose 65 just kind of as a buffer. Anyway, the, uh, that, that is where you really see a machine like the YK uh, really draw its benefit is in those types of, of climates because they can manipulate the water in ways that something like a train couldn't and it really gets the efficiency back out of them. Uh, something uh, I'll point out, so on this compressor, uh, Yorks are a what's called an open drive system. So on the left side of that screen, you'll see a little uh, nub sticking out the back of the diagram. That is the, uh, it's a tapered shaft, which uh, uh, I have done a shaft seal video on a YK. If you go see that, you'll see kind of what I'm talking about. But it's a tapered shaft that uh, just has a bolt up flange to a open air compressor. So if you can change, I'm sorry, I say compressor, I meant motor, open air motor. So you can change the motor and do a lot of, uh, a lot of service. It has a lot of serviceability that something like a train or a carrier wouldn't have. Those run, uh, the, the motor is in the refrigerant stream. So train especially, uh, I say train especially, even carrier. So they use uh, refrigerant to cool that motor and to keep, keep the motor and the bearings assemblies uh, at a proper temperature for, for operation where York just allows, you know, it's just a regular open air, uh, open drip leg, um, just motor on the back of, on the back of the compressor uh, with a, with a coupling, with a, it's got a metal flexible coupling in between there. It's not like a coupling you'd see on a, on a chill water pump or something, um, or maybe, I guess maybe on a larger scale you would, but anyway, uh, so yes. Scrolls, screws, and then you have your centrifugals. That's what a centrifugal looks like. Here's some basic principles surrounding that. Uh, I will take a second to see about any questions because I, again, I apologize. I know I'm moving quick, but I, I need to. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Trying to see if pretty good chat going. You see a question here from Sterling, how to troubleshoot a liquid level sensor. What level of liquid should I have? How should I measure it? Uh, all right, so Sterling, I, that is gonna be dependent on the machine. Uh, so if you would give me a little more detail about a, if you've got a specific machine in mind uh, I'll try to get to it, honestly, that that's a little more of an in-depth uh, question. So I don't know that we're going to have time. Uh, da, 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 da. Do, 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 do. Okay. All right, we're going to move on. Let's go into evaporator types. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's a, I uh, forgot this was in there. What else is hiding from me? Yeah, this is it. So evaporator types, uh, just kind of give you a, another visual. Uh, this is the inlet of a uh, centrifugal compressor. From the looks of it, I, I, it looks like maybe a carrier series. Anyway, uh, you can see the inlet guide vane paddles. You can also see the uh, impeller 
sitting right there. It's a fairly small one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a carrier design, just kind of looking at it. Uh, most of these photos I just kind of snagged off of Google Photos. So I don't, none of these are actually mine, by the way. I should probably preference that. Uh, and so, yeah, just kind of give you another visual. All right, we're going to roll on. So you have three types of evaporators when it comes to most chiller or most centrifugals. Um, if, of the of the non-centrifugal style, so scroll and screw. As far as I'm aware, those just use a basic flooded type. Uh, I don't. I can't think of one off of memory that that uses anything else. Anyway, centrifugals though. You've got three basic styles. You've got a flooded, which is what most everybody is used to, is what we're familiar with, is what we understand. Uh, then you've also got what's known as a falling film. So the flooded, if you're reading your screen, is on the left, falling film on the far right. Um, flooded, if you look at the diagram or the picture, the refrigerant is all the way up to the top of the uh, upper level of the tubes. And then it shouldn't be much higher than that. You just, you wanna have just enough refrigerant to cover the tubes. And then the rest of it is just vapor boiling off. Uh, most centrifugals run a degree or two or less. You know, some of them only run half a degree of superheat at a time. So it's really critical that uh, you're monitoring your uh, liquid level in the evaporator and that it's not uh, getting too much. And one of the ways you can see that, so uh, centrifugals don't monitor literal suction superheat, but they have discharge superheat. So if you begin to see your discharge superheat uh, begin to run really low for any reason, you need to start evaluating what's going on in the evaporator because it may be having an issue that's leading to uh, leading to that. Uh, if you haven't ever seen it before, the when you start having uh, a slugging is probably a, a more correct term. I don't I wouldn't call it flooding. One second. When you start having a, a slugging to a centrifugal impeller if you ever open one of those up, uh, it literally looks like somebody took the suction and bell off and just fired some buckshot up into the impeller. That those little, So what's happening there is you having little bitty droplets of liquid refrigerant get pulled off the top of the refrigerant uh, level, the liquid level in the evaporator, and those little bitty droplets are able to actually make it to the impeller. At that point, you're, you're basically running no superheat at all. Uh, that's a really bad condition because those droplets, like I said, it's just like throwing a, you know, these are vapor machines. This, this, this uh, centrifugals are vapor, um, they, they, they move vapor. They don't, they don't do liquid just like anything else. And honestly, you know, you can get away sometimes with some liquid with a screw and a scroll. You're not going to get away with that with a centrifugal. Uh, and what that'll lead to is once that starts to happen, you'll, like I said, once that starts to happen, you'll see the uh, on the inlet of the nose cone, you'll see just chunks missing and taking out. Uh, and if it was a rubbing thing, usually that's going to happen up here on the ceiling surfaces where it can rub, which can happen. That's a whole other uh, issue dealing with the, the oil and the seals. But if the actual louvers themselves in the impeller start to look like that, that is a sign that you've been, they've, somebody's been running too high of a liquid level for whatever reason, or, it's, or the heat exchange has not been happening properly. Something has gone horribly wrong in that evaporator and it's allowing that liquid to make it to the, um, to the impeller. So really critical that that is monitored to some degree and that you're paying attention Specifically, I usually just watch my discharge superheat. If my discharge superheat is maintaining, which varies a little bit per machine, uh, then I'm, I'm comfortable with, uh, with how things are going and I don't hear anything as well. Because 
when these get out of balance, so centrifugals are very finely balanced, and when they begin to get out of balance, you'll hear it, you'll know it. It's, it's pretty, pretty dramatic. Uh, and it only just goes downhill from there. Uh, so falling film, I'll get to the middle one here in a second. Falling film is a radically different design. Uh, with a falling film, we're actually uh, inputting the refrigerant into the top of the barrel. Now, I didn't preface this earlier. A flooded the refrigerant gets injected from the bottom of the, of the barrel. Uh, with a falling film, we inject it in the top. It comes down onto a distributor rail and is spread across that evaporator. And we literally mist the refrigerant down over the tubes. And so with a falling film, you will have basically very little to none at all in terms of standing liquid refrigerant. It's a, it's a fairly efficient design, but what really makes it worth it is it requires significantly less refrigerant. And look at that diagram. So you see that, salt, that, that dark blue line for the flooded evaporator. And you see that that falling film one on the right doesn't have that. That's quite literally the, the goal there is we're trying to reduce the amount of refrigerant that machine requires dramatically. Like I said, though, it does come with some efficiency costs. So this is where they have what I refer to it as a, a hybrid. Uh, most of the technicians I've worked with, we usually refer to it as a hybrid evaporator. Uh, they've got it depicted as a mixed falling film uh, for whatever reasons, personal choice, I don't know. Anyway, um, and it is, it is exactly as it sounds. It's both of them combined. You're still inputting the, uh, the, the refrigerant into the top of the evaporator. The suction's always out the top of the evaporator, so that doesn't change no matter which three types you have. So the... The refrigerant's getting inputted into it. It still has a rail, but the rate at which we're putting the refrigerant in, we do end up with a standing, uh, standing liquid in the bottom. And that's where, like, a, a York, York is, this is the most common design they use on their YK series. Uh, they, they have used the flooded type, but, but almost everything that they're producing now is coming out with a, a uh, hybrid evaporator because you get tremendous efficiency out of it because you do still have a layer of um, you do still have a layer of liquid refrigerant standing that is processing that refrigerant down, but you also are able to dramatically reduce the amount of refrigerant required. So it's it's a very effective system and you run a lot less risk of um, a lot less risk of, of having uh, superheat issues. So usually uh, like a York YK will run a half a degree to one degree of superheat and run it confidently. One of the reasons it can do that is because it is making use of a hybrid uh, hybrid style evaporator. Ultimately, though, your approach values should be basically the same. You, you, should, you shouldn't see much of a difference between them. Now, the flooded is the most efficient when it comes to uh, actual heat transfer. So you can have a smaller evaporator footprint with a flooded and with a, with a falling film, it's going to require a much larger evaporator. You can also see, you know, look at the depiction of the number of tubes from one to the other. You know, it requires a lot more surface area to get the same amount of heat transfer with a falling film. And then a hybrid, like I said, it's, it's going to be in the middle. It doesn't have to be quite as huge, but it's going to still be a fairly good size evaporator with a lot of tubes inside so that it can properly capture uh, all, of that, um, all of that refrigerant. So just keep that in mind. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, 
let's see, do those hybrids still have a liquid level sensor? Yes. Now, York, for example, they don't put a liquid level sensor on the evaporator. The liquid level sensor goes in the, um, in the condenser, but uh, train will use a liquid level sensor on the evaporator. They're very common to do that. So you, you'll see that with a train system. Uh, there's, there's several series out there that I could think of that, that use that on the evaporator, but York is using it on the uh, condenser side. And this is just kind of another example of how we're exchanging heat. Uh, you know, just to give you another depiction, I'll give you a second to kind of look at that and kind of get an idea of what it is we're doing here. Uh, and then we have, here's a, I think this is a pretty good one, honestly. This is more of a, well, I'm not gonna say it's train. It is technically a train slide. This is one of their presentation slides that they uh, present. But this would be an example of a, uh, of a flooded type evaporator. And what, there's two things I want to point out here, or three things really. One, the orifice. Notice that it says orifice. We're going to come back to that a little bit later, not too much later, when we go over the metering devices. But in addition, let me move my little, can I move my picture? Maybe not. I want you to see the liquid level distributor. So in the bottom, you'll see that kind of golden plate. That plate is a, uh, that is exactly what, or it's not exactly, it's very similar to what you're using in a falling film type, except it's in the bottom. And what that does is just a distribution rail. Its main focus and goal is to help spread the refrigerant out because you gotta think, you may have a 20 foot long evaporator, bigger, longer, and you, <sighs> you need to make sure that refrigerant gets distributed evenly across that whole evaporator because what it will do, and this is where the eliminator there in the top looks like a screen mesh off of a door. This is where the eliminator comes into play is that eliminator is literally just a big screen and it is, uh, it is forcing the uh, refrigerant to pull more evenly because what will happen is if, you, if the eliminator is not there, right where the suction elbow pulls from, the liquid refrigerant will literally uh, uh, kind of build up and pull up into it and it'll draw and you'll have this big hump right there underneath it. And that's because there, there's so much uh, velocity and, and, and uh, just force flowing uh, trying to, to the, for that compressor pulling the suction gas back that allows that to happen. So by putting the eliminator in there, it reduces that effect and helps spread the, uh, the liquid refrigerant pool across the entire evaporator instead of it being allowed to just pull in just one section. So those eliminators are very handy. If I remember correctly, uh, if one of so I've got a couple of videos I've done on a CVHE CVHE teardown, and one of them I pretty sure I showed you a shot of down inside the evaporator uh, without the suction elbow on, and you can see the top side of that screen in there. There's a playlist for uh, centrifugal teardowns, and I think it's like the first or second video in that. I'm pretty confident I have a shot of that screen where you can actually see it, get a visual. Uh, could, did you steal your recovery subcooler from a train? <laughs> no, uh, my subcooler did not come from a piece of equipment. I uh, spec'd it, found it online, and did all that uh, directly. I didn't actually repurpose it from anything else. Uh, do, 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 do. Jason, I didn't, I actually, I found it, found a guy off of eBay at the time. Um, and I think one of the guys recently found the one I got. Uh, I think he got it on eBay as well. I don't know that it's on Amazon. It may be, it may be. Uh, you're welcome to throw a link up. 
Uh, it's a 16 plate, by the way, 16 plate. All right, let's get into condensers. Man, we're already, whew, time's gonna be tight. Oh, here's another good picture. Man, I forgot to put some of these in there. So this is just another depiction of a, this is from York, of a of the hybrid falling film. Give you just a really solid example of what that actually looks like. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, you can see, you can see, so in the middle there where it looks like it's got the, the single sprayer coming down and kind of spraying out, that's actually a rail that runs the entire length of the evaporator that's not just in that one spot. And, and it, it does exactly, like I said, it, it mists the refrigerant out to rain down over the tube assembly. So there you go. All right, let's get into condensers. So there's two main types of condensers. Uh, you have subcooled and non-subcooled uh, styles. Now, granted, they all have some version of subcooling, but a lot of them, specifically like Train, the way that they do theirs with their economizer, it, it you don't actually have a dedicated subcooler circuit like you would have on, say, like a York, for example. So the uh, ultimately, with the way that happens, you have your discharge refrigerant comes in and hits the top of a distribution plate that you know distributes the discharge gas across the entire machine. That is very important because if that plate wasn't there, that refrigerant would have enough force to uh, completely displace the refrigerant in the bottom of the machine of the uh, of the barrel, and it's going to cause a lot of just flow issues uh, and just efficiency problems. So anyway, in the same way, we need rails in the evaporator to distribute refrigerant. We need rails in the condenser to do the same thing for the gas. From there, uh, we start at the top and we just uh, work our way down in terms of uh, the refrigerant. Uh, or the, the, the refrigerant getting cooled, and it literally will begin to cool and condense on the pipes and then just kind of drips and rains down into the bottom and then collects in the bottom of the, uh, the condenser barrel. Uh, if I think I've got another, yeah, here you go. So the image on the right is a condenser, I'm sorry, a train. So this would be a train style. And you'll notice that the tubes kind of stop just shy of the bottom and there's not a significant amount of liquid refrigerant ever really standing in the bottom of that, uh, of that condenser. And that kind of, that is how train does it. And it does have some liquid refrigerant. It doesn't, it's not completely dry. And it's not that the tubes never make contact, but it doesn't have a dedicated subcooler circuit to process that refrigerant down. But again, when we get into the economizer side, you'll see kind of how train makes up for that in their own way, at least on the CVH series. Uh, and then York, on the other hand, if you look, that is the picture on the left, uh, you'll see that it's coming into the condenser and at the very bottom, you'll have this, this tight little packed bundle of tubes. And if you ever open one up to brush the tubes and you sit one side by side, you know, a train in New York, you'll see the difference in how they configure their tube design. Those lower tubes right there at the bottom of that barrel are your, uh, those are your, that is your subcooler circuit. Some really critical things to know about that system is there's actually a uh, distributor rail that sits over those tubes and uh, per York spec, you'll see a sight glass on the condenser. Uh, so when you're looking through that sight glass, you need to make sure that the liquid refrigerant level is three quarters to one inch above that, uh, that plate because you won't be able to see those tubes literally in the bottom of that barrel. You'll just see this big silver shiny thing inside of there. That is that distribution railing that is covering over the tubes. 
It is for distribution. Uh, but the reason that's critical is those tubes specifically are sitting inside of a rack. And if that refrigerant level in the condenser is too low and it's not able to maintain above that plate, it creates a significant amount of turbulence that is able to get into that into those tubes and makes them rattle around. And at that point, it is only a matter of time before they rattle enough to rub a hole somewhere. Uh, which, you know, you would see that kind of stuff with eddy currents. Hopefully you're doing that and you would catch that ahead of time. Not everybody does. Uh, but something, uh, kind of a critical note there on, um, on uh, uh, York specifically. So kind of just a different design. It's, it's nothing fancy and hoopla. It's just some of them have the tubes, some of them don't. See, but I still got pictures up here. Okay, we're going to get into refrigerant circuits. All right, I don't have as much in the way of pictures for this. Let me, let me see here. All right, let's go with this. All right, as we've kind of seen going through this, uh, Got your evaporator, got your compressor, your volute coming into your condenser, liquid coming out, and we'll just say this is a flooded machine. Uh, and we have our suction elbow coming out from there. It's really as simple as that. Uh, now, where train, and low pressure machines become a little different is we have a, um, we have a purge assembly. Make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself in a little bit. That's all right. We have a purge assembly. So it's specifically to uh, remove non-condensables from the chiller. So why would we have non-condensables? Why wouldn't we take care of that whenever we were pulling vacuums? So low pressure machines run in a vacuum. That's why they're referred to as low pressure. Uh, they, the evaporator especially will almost always be, or well not almost, it'll always be in a negative. So if you have any kind of leaks, even very minor ones, it's gonna have the ability to draw that uh, atmosphere into the system. And that's another thing that you have to be careful with too, is when a machine sits idle for a long period of time, uh, it, the seals can sometimes uh, get displaced is how I'll say it. And that can allow some leakage. And that's why it's always really good to make sure you're cycling and routinely um, swapping your machines on a lead lag basis uh, you know, once a week or however you decide to do it. But that also helps those seals in the system um, stay fresher because of vibration and use. And ultimately, it's going to help prevent leaks that may not have formed. Regardless, when those leaks are there, you're sucking in air into the system. And we have to be able to get that air out because non-condensables will stack in the condenser because that's exactly what they do. Uh, when you get a non-condensable in the system like that, it will sit here and it will just eventually kind of build up until you get to where you, you've got so much air, literal air in the system, that it, it can't properly heat exchange anymore. You're going to see your approach value uh, significantly increase. Uh, if you saw one of my shorts the other day, uh, I made a mistake and I accidentally referenced the entering water versus condenser saturation. Uh, I, I, what I meant to say, and I'm saying now, is it's the leaving condenser water versus the condenser saturation gives you your approach value. When that approach value begins to get high, that could be an indicator of atmosphere in that system. So you would need that purge assembly to be able to pull that back out of it. 
Uh, how it does that is it's got a little um, it's got a little evaporator chamber with a coil in it, and it's got its own separate little little small refrigerant circuit. It almost looks like a window unit with this just kind of shell evaporator sitting on top of the condenser. Um, that's that's a pretty I'd say a pretty good comparator. Anyway. Um, the actually you know what it looks more like if you ever work on drink fountains uh that's almost exactly what that purge unit looks like just maybe a little bigger anyway the what it's trying to do is in that evaporator it has a refrigerant coil um and so a lot of times you'll have a just a regular uh, PRV type metering device just constantly feeding through or AXV or something of the sort feeding that refrigerant through and this can be uh, they used to be 134 I think more of the new ones are 404 now if I'm not mistaken anyway uh, they're a completely separate refrigerant circuit going over to a condenser coil and a compressor and such uh, we also then have a vapor line coming off the top of the condenser going into that tank and a, uh, we have a drain line coming out going through a filter assembly back into the condenser, tying back in. What this is doing is is pulling any gases off the top of the condenser and it's using uh, just a natural uh, pos not positive displacement it's using a natural siphon to siphon those gases into this chamber and then this little refrigerant coil in here cools that chamber down and again air doesn't condense this at the same rate that refrigerant does. And so what it can do is say it's 123A or 123, forget the A, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, the refrigerant will condense uh, on, the, on the cold evaporator and it will begin to build liquid in the bottom and that liquid will naturally gravity feed its way back. And that's why it sits up here so this whole system is uh, is passive in its uh, refrigerant movement, and meaning it doesn't have a compressor pushing it. So, um, uh, sorry. Anyway, while it's doing this, uh, eventually the atmosphere will build up enough in the top of this chamber. Now your liquid refrigerant in here may be down here, but you'll get enough atmosphere in here that it can no longer provide enough heat into that evaporator uh, coil. What happens when it can't provide heat? Same thing as cutting off the airflow to a regular evaporator uh, or cutting the water off, we lose superheat. And that's what we're monitoring on our suction line going back to our uh, little miniature compressor. So when it sees that that suction temperature plummets past a certain set point for a train, I think it's eight degrees Fahrenheit, uh, eight, not eight, sorry, 18, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. When it trips past that point, uh, it registers that, hey, I am, I have enough atmosphere in me to do a pump out. At that point, uh, there is a little bitty, tiny pump that sucks the atmosphere off the top of this chamber and runs it and vents it outside through the venting for the chiller. That way we can get rid of all that atmosphere in there. Uh, so that is kind of a important part of a low pressure machine refrigerant circuit and specifically train. Now York has come out with a low uh, pressure series again they had discontinued it for a very long time uh, so they do exist out there either the YZ 
Yeah, I think it's the YZ series is York's new um, uh, is York's new uh, low pressure machine. Sorry. Anyway, the CVH series for a train is a low pressure series. Uh, so the other thing that makes train unique and I guess I will, yeah, I'll get into it now. Come on. The other thing that makes train unique is they have a economizer. So this economizer will be on the condenser side of the system. So if you're looking at, um, make sure you, yeah. If you're looking at the chiller this way, so here's your condenser. You'll have your volute tying in from your compressor. Here's your compressor body. Evaporator's down here doing its thing. So coming off of, uh, coming off of the bottom, I may draw this in blue, if I can find my blue. Coming off the bottom of the condenser, you'll have your uh, liquid line coming out, and in that line, it's going to have a orifice. This is a fixed orifice. It's literally just a flat plate with a bunch of holes in it at a very specific size. And that feeds, that flashes the refrigerant. And if, if you are familiar with how York uses a uh, flash tank in order to, um, in order to flash the, uh, uh, come on. How York uses a flash tank in order to get the, uh, the refrigerant to stage to, pre-flash before going to the evaporator so they can pull that gas out while well, train is using the exact same concept. Uh, so on this big black insulated thing on the side of the condenser, this line flashes here at this first orifice and then comes up into the economizer itself. In that economizer, depending on whether you have a CVHE or F, now, like I said earlier, what I depicted was a CVHF, it was a two-stage. A CVHE is a three-stage, meaning there's three impellers inside of that compressor housing. So first feeds into the second, second feeds into the third, third feeds into the condenser. Otherwise, it's the exact same design and, and uh, operating concept. So I want to make sure I'm doing this right, yeah. So say we have a CVHF, we'll start with that drawing. That means we've got a two-stage compressor. We come into the economizer and we're, we're flashed. We have a medium pressure refrigerant. It's no longer high pressure. It's not truly at our low pressure state. It's at a medium pressure. And so, we take that flash gas and it naturally accumulates in the top of the economizer and our uh, flashed liquid is in the bottom. Then we pull off the top of that economizer and pull back into the compressor. It specifically doesn't pull into the suction inbell of the first stage, it pulls into the, uh, in between the last, stage impeller and the impeller in front of it. So the reason I said it that way, if it's a CVHF with two stages, it'll just tie directly into the middle of those. Uh, if it's a CVHE, and I'll draw that a little different here in a minute, but uh, actually, what am I saying? CVHE's got two lines coming off. Absolutely disregard that. I'll get there eventually, guys, don't worry. Uh, anyway, all right, so pulling off, hitting this, hitting these uh, in between the stages on the compressor and we're pulling that flash gas back out. 
Then we come out again, go through another orifice, and then feed into our evaporator, which is down here. This is a flooded system. Uh, so we have two points of flashing. This is our second stage flash, first stage flash, the economizer pulls off. Uh, so just think about that whenever it comes out of this condenser here and feeds over, instead of it being a straight shot, it's actually gonna come out, up, into this flash tank, back out of the flash tank and into the evaporator and then over here, you're going to see the, uh, not a literal representation, but the economizer line pulling back into the compressor. Again, not a literal representation. Basic train economizer. Now, let's say we have a CVHE series, means three stage. It's very similar design. The difference is we have a biter plate in the middle of the, of the economizer. In that divider plate, there's a little chamber down here at the bottom. And in that chamber, there is another orifice right here. So the refrigerant comes over, feeds down, goes through another orifice and flashes again. And then there is a second economizer line coming in. And so in between all uh, in between the stages of the compressors, you're hitting an economizer line in between each. So it, essentially between first and second stage impeller is where the uh, second phase of the economizer feeds into. And in between second and third stage impeller, is where the first stage of the economizer feeds into. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, and from there, again, you just, yeah, so you have three stages of flashing, one, two, and three on that style system. Uh, you get, I, I think the CVHEs, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty confident they're a little more efficient. They're definitely more expensive. Uh, but I think where that third compressor comes in is they have better lift capabilities and they have higher efficiency spreading the um, refrigerant load across the uh, three impellers instead of two. If somebody has some input on that, feel free to throw that into the comments. Uh, all right, that is your train economizer. And that's your basic train refrigerant circuit. Now this does not include the oil circuit. Ooh, that does not complete the train circuit though. Uh, think about it. We also have motor cooling, very important piece. Just about forgot it. So, see if I can I'll really test my artistic skills tonight. With the train, uh, depending on the series, will depend on, or not the series, but the revision, depending on the revision, will dictate where the oil sump assembly is, but it could be of one of two places. Either up here between the uh, barrels or down here in the bottom. So I'm going to depict it down here. It gives me more, more room to draw. <laughs> Arts and crafts. So, on this motor, so this is our compressor. On the back end of that compressor, you've got a motor sticking out. To kind of represent that, oh, to give you all another look at a uh, CVHE, sorry, kind of shifting gears there a little bit, but just another example. Um, the, uh, yes, uh, Chris, the, when they're higher up, they're older series, the newer series have it down on the ground. Anyway, Two-stage compressor, three-stage compressor for train. Now, let me back up here and go here. All right. 
Oh, one thing that's kind of neat about this slide, you can see the purge assembly on the back side there, uh, kind of the third way up toward the left end of the screen. That is a representation of the purge. Anyway, focusing in on the motor on the right side of the screen, you, uh, that is what we're, we're feeding, um, that's what we're feeding refrigerant into because we have to maintain that stator temperature. Uh, if we don't, it will overheat and get hot. So to kind of give you just a visual, coming out the back side, here's our stator. On this stator, there is a little uh, refrigerant pump down here in the oil assembly, and that pump is driven by a gear from the oil pump. So as the oil pump turns, it's got a, I don't know if it's a bull gear, whatever style of gear it is, uh, that oil pump spins the refrigerant pump. The refrigerant pump is pulling from the condenser. Yep, bottom of the condenser. Pretty confident that's right. Second guessing myself now. Anyway, we're pulling refrigerant into this pump and it doesn't mix with the oil, all right? So don't let that freak you out. Just because we're pulling refrigerant into the oil pump assembly doesn't mean it's actually interacting with the oil. That's it's technically a separate circuit inside of it. Um, so anyway, the, it pulls in to this little pump and then pushes it out to the middle, uh, middle inlet port on the uh, stator housing. There is a little orifice right there. It is very common for that orifice to get debris in it. Uh, if you work on these machines long enough, you'll just have it to where the motor won't maintain cooling. And vast majority of the time when you start to see that condition, the first thing you should check is your uh, motor cooling orifice because uh, now, to do this, this is all in the refrigerant circuit. You've got to take this machine down to make all this happen. So it's not as simple and easy as just open it up. But uh, I've seen all kinds of pictures and um, you know, just different scenarios guys have ran into where that orifice plate will plug up, stop up, and just cause all kinds of havoc. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, from there, you've got your uh, low side. So the, the refrigerant shoots in, distributes, you know, the motor is spinning, so it's got a lot of turbulence in there. And then it comes out of two ports on either side, and these will come down and Y together. These then feed into a, um, a separator. Uh, so when these feed into the separator, this is also what allows your oil to drain back. Because part of your oil system is you've got an oil inlet here for the tail bearing and then the inboard bearing, there's another oil inlet, yada, yada. There's several pipes that go into this little, uh, you know, accumulator style uh, device on the, on the back side underneath the motor. Anyway, the, the purpose of this is so that uh, any oil that gets trapped and pulled through, it falls to the bottom and then drains back to the oil sump, but the refrigerant itself gets pulled back into the, uh, back into the evaporator. And you want your oil sump, if everything is functioning properly, your oil sump will typically run just slightly uh, less pressure. I think they want uh, is it, uh, 0.2 psi lower pressure, not psi, um, inches, 0.2 inches of mercury lower on your oil sump than your evaporator. At that point, you know that that's just one, one reading to verify you have optimal uh, oil return and, f and flow through the system. Whew, that was a lot. That's just a CVHF, and, or that's just a CVH series. Uh, York. 
Yeah, we're not going to get as far as I wanted. York is honestly, in my opinion, a simpler design in terms of their refrigerant circuit. And I may not even draw it here. I'm probably just going to pull it up on the pull it up over here. So York. So this is a York style. Uh, let's see if I can get a. Oh, okay, this is a York style machine. Um, the uh, uh, hang on, CVH can have only one or three. Or CVHF can have two impellers. Okay. Uh, that's actually news to me. I've never seen a CVHE with just a single impeller. So that'd be pretty cool, honestly. I haven't, I haven't looked into that. Uh, anyway, moving on. So looking at this York, uh, looking at this York system. So this would be like a. This would be a. So this is a. Uh, looking at it, this is a flooded, yep, this is a flooded style. So this has an economizer assembly attached to it. So I'm going to preface with that. That's going to change it a little bit. Most of the Yorks that we deal with do not have, um, do not have a, uh, uh, economizer in our area. I'd actually, I don't even know that I've seen a YK series or YT with an economizer assembly. Anyway, uh, regardless of that, refrigerant is, so on the left side is your condenser, refrigerant's flowing down, goes through a uh, metering device, feeds into the economizer chamber. This is now we're looking at the bottom middle of the screen at uh, item number F, if you can see that. So we come out of that, on, uh, out the bottom of that economizer, we then feed back up into the bottom after going through a second um, uh, metering valve or metering, metering device and feeding into the bottom of the evaporator, which then gets pulled back up into the suction side uh, of the compressor and then pushed back into the discharge on top of the condenser. Now, one of the things to note is this machine has a, um, uh, it's after it goes through the first flash on the, on the economizer, you'll see the pipe kind of comes up the middle of the screen and then shoots back over to the left above the condenser. That is your economizer side uh, pump. And so it's just taking the, um, it's taking the flash gas and just putting it back through the condenser so that it can uh, just recondense and get sent back through the system. So uh, where a train is pulling it back into the, the actual centrifugal compressor, this particular machine is using a separate uh, pump to move that refrigerant through. You also have a uh, hot gas bypass on top of there. Now that is something that a lot of machines can, um, can have, but not too many. We're seeing it more and more in our area, but not, a, not too many around yet. I know we're about to put one in that does. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. Anyway, that hot gas bypass is for capacity and load control. So the, between the PRVs and the centrifugal itself, it is capable of unloading fairly heavily, uh, but it can only unload itself so far without stalling out the compressor. So what we can do is we can open the uh, hot gas bypass assembly and let some of that refrigerant bypass without having to go through the compressor itself. It also helps lower the lift on it. And when we do that, 
uh, we're, we're actually lowering the capacity even further uh, on, uh, on our, on our uh, chiller. So we're just, we're getting more unloading ability at that point. And in a lot of cases, um, yeah, a lot of times your hot gas bypass is specifically intended for that purpose. It's gonna be some kind of loading control or something of those sorts. Let's roll through some questions real quick. Uh, not making the time I wanted to, but that's okay. This is a lot of information. We're gonna have to spend a lot of time if we're gonna cover this in any kind of legitimacy. I, right now, I'm just really trying to get the concepts across to you and the different components. Uh, we have these classes uh, once a month, every third Tuesday and Wednesday. So we're gonna have another one tonight. It's gonna be a continuation of tonight um, it was going to be, uh, so tonight was kind of mechanical principle. And then usually the second night, like we were going to do a controls principle tomorrow, given how I've not made it halfway through my list yet. Um, we may make an adjustment to that. So it may be kind of a part two and I can try to finish all my topics tomorrow. Anyway. Uh, so we use hot gas bypass here in Arizona for the winter months. We have to oversize and there's so much. Yeah, that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and it does. Hot gas bypasses are very effective on, you can, I think uh, the centrifugals themselves can unload depending on the machine anywhere from, uh, the thing down to what, 40 to 30% on most of them of their capacity. And then if you have a hot gas installed, a lot of times they, those can get you down to like 15%, 15, 20% of capacity. It's, it's incredible how much, how much uh, it can benefit you. Uh, will the hot gas be more useful for low load and also keep the chiller online as opposed to cycling and running a low suction temp? Yes, absolutely, John, uh, Jason. Uh, that's exactly what it's intended for. Sure, worked on have three. Oh, y'all are discussing the impeller thing. Do, 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 do. Okay. We've got a little bit of time left. I can cover this next one fairly quickly. Probably not as quick as I would like to. Anyway. Uh, right now, we are seeing a major shift in the industry, major shift. So with that shift, things, uh, mag bearing, mag bearing is becoming a real technology. I'm just going to speak on it and I'll probably finish the class out on this. Uh, you need to start to study and learn and understand mag bearing technology. And even deeper than that, if you're not familiar with variable speed or variable frequency, technology, you know, if, if VFDs are not something you're overly strong in, and you're not also, you don't have any idea on how mag bearing equipment works, and you're gonna work on the heavy side or the chiller side or anything more than split systems and basic RTUs, then you need to start to understand, study, and learn these subjects. Uh, the sooner the better. Doesn't mean you necessarily have to have the hands on, but you need to begin to understand the concepts behind them and how to uh, utilize them. Because this is the this is the in, the future of our industry. Just as VRF and VRV have started to take over the market, and pretty much everything is starting to switch over to that. Not completely, but a lot of the chiller of the just HVAC market is going that direction. Mag bearing technology and variable speed technology is right there with it. That being said, um, <sighs> mag bearing, there's some real basic components to understand. And I'm going to throw the compressor that I would recommend you start with in your studies would be this. This is a uh, turbo core made by Danfoss. 
Now, the first thing I'm gonna throw out there is Dan Foss has a app known as the Turbo Tool. I can actually pull it up here and you can kind of see it for yourself. This is a fantastic app, not only as a, just a quick reference guide for troubleshooting, it is not a complete troubleshooting guide, uh, but it does, it, it is very effective for, um, uh, for just very basic reference and troubleshooting. This is the app, so it's kind of what it looks like. So when you go, just search Turbo Tool uh, in the App Store. You need to download this app. You need to begin to read through it. Uh, a lot of manufacturers use this compressor, and this is probably one of the best entry-level mag bearing machines you could get, get into. Uh, uh, Daikin uses it very heavily. The WMC series, which I know a lot of you have constantly request videos and stuff on. Genuinely, I'm, I'm trying to do them, uh, but it's not as easy as that because I have a job to do. But uh, between uh, Daikin, Smart, Arctic Cool, Multistack, just general retrofit. So in the same way I was referencing earlier on a built-up system, we were putting in uh, uh, those handbells. Well, these turbo cores, even they're they're centrifugal. They are they're every bit of centrifugal technology. These are getting put in instead now. And it's not that the handbells aren't being put in at all, but these are going to replace what like handbell has done in the market and is going to continue to. Now they're not perfect in every, every application. Anyway, there's some real basic components that you need to understand with this, uh, with this compressor. So on the right side of your screen, you are looking at the suction inlet. Uh, that is also where your IGVs are gonna be housed. Moving a little further back into the cutout there, you see, um, uh, you see the impellers. Now this particular one is a dual impeller assembly. There, some of these smaller ones are only single impeller. They do not have dual. So there's, there's a, you have a 300 series, a 350, a 400. If I remember, I think there's a 400 and a 450. The 500 is discontinued, but they still exist out in the field, and the 500 turned into the 700, if I'm not mistaken. If somebody has more current data, you're, please throw it, in, throw it in the comment section. Anyway, uh, yeah, so you see your impellers there. Moving further back, you get into the rotor. This compressor, part of what has made it so special is one, it's tiny. Uh, and it packs a punch for what it can do. The impellers on this thing can sit in my hand. Uh, they're, they're just inches in size, but this, this compressor will run itself at uh, really high rates of speed. So, you know, it's, it's really easy for this thing to hit 25, 30,000 RPM in a heartbeat. And so, yes, it is an extremely high RPM motor. Uh, and I forget where the RPM tops out, but I think it's as much as in, in the 30s, if not pushing 40,000 RPM, something like that. It, it does depend a little bit depending on which compressor you're looking at. Uh, but this is a mag bearing compressor. This is an oilless system. There is not an ounce of oil in this, and there's a lot, a lot of the mag bearing technology that manufacturers are implementing on their in-house stuff. Daikin is a prime example of this with their CVR WME series machines. They're as closely as they can copying what Dan Foss did here without blatantly breaking patents. And, and uh, Daikin in particular, I mean, they basically will, will, they'll tell you that. I mean, they, when they sat down and began to design the CVH E series, which is their larger tonnage uh, machine, uh, I think they start at 1,500 tons or somewhere in there. And anyway, uh, they used a, 
they used the, the turbo core as their base technology and built from there to create their own. Um, the bearings, so you're asking yourself the question, okay, well, how, what do the bearings do? And this is where you, the term PWM, pulse width modulation. If there is one term that you should start to learn and become very familiar with in across all kinds of sectors of our industry, it is PWM technology. VFDs are pulse width technology. We use PWM more and more on automation and control side. Um, I say more and more. It is, it, there's a lot of systems out there, especially with SCRs, that those use PWM uh, control circuits in the cards to run them. <laughs> you also have uh, um, your... Uh, your, your mag bearings are pulse width modulated bearings. Now, a lot of people, when you think of a magnetic bearing, what that is, is that's literally a core, uh, and I'll kind of draw it here. It's, it's, a, it's a core that, you know, here's your, the center, your shaft is sitting in here, and you're talking extremely fine, finely ref, uh, uh, machined, uh, tolerances like these things are tight and there is a coil up t uh, on this side coil on this side coil now this is the bearing this is not a stator this is not a motor this is a bearing you have four coils on that bearing What they do is you think, okay, magnets, magnets attract, and that's what we're trying to do. No, actually, most of the time with magnet, uh, with mag bearing tech, we're actually using the repel side of the equation. So uh, each of these are generating a electromagnet, and, and our shafts are typically a permanent magnet, and they can uh, demagnetize, which is, will cause all kinds of its own issues, and it is a problem that turbo cores have. Anyway, uh, the, each of these magnets are working in unison with each other through the PWM module. That PWM module is the bearing control module inside of this compressor. And every, uh, so uh, another, so a smaller version York has, or what am I saying? York's version of this, uh, uh, the uh, YMC squared series, use uh, mag bearing, it's mag bearing tech. And those, the PRVs, don't even rotate. They're in fixed position at a hundred and something degree angle. You know, for they're literally, all they are is pre-rotation. They don't have any kind of load control. All that's done through a, a VFD to speed the motor up and down. But uh, it's got a, a, a mag bearing assembly inside of there. And you have a PWM module. because uh, So on like a YMC squared, if you're standing on the control cabinet side of the chiller, you've got your, your uh, OptiView control panel. You've got your VSD control panel. And that feeds everything over power and communication to the other side. So if you walk around the other side of the chiller, you'll on the very back end of it, on the back end of the, where the motor is, you'll have your um, bearing control cabinet. And that's all that's inside of there. There's, you'll open it up. There's all kinds of boards and gizmos. And those are to run these bearings. And again, they're all pulse width modulation, PWM. Study that term. Uh, to kind of finish up on the turbo core, this compressor has a VFD built into it as part of why it is special. On the top side there, you see all the kind of electronic looking components. Uh, that is your VFD. On the back side, you'll have a four bank capacitor bus that is running your capacitors just like any VFD has. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with VFDs, now's the time. Um, 
and then your uh, you, you've got your SDRs on top, which feed into the capacitor bank, which then feed into the uh, inverter, which then feeds down into the stator assembly. Uh, the inverter is on the very bottom. Uh, and then on the side of the compressor to the left, you'll see there's another little cabinet door thing you can take off. That is your, what's called the back plane assembly. Uh, that's where all your control modules are. So you have a BCCM uh, control module, which is your main brain. You have a serial card, and then you also have your PWM module, which runs your bearings. Uh, and this machine, this is, a mach this is something you're gonna plug a laptop into if you're gonna do any real troubleshooting on it. You don't have to every time. If it's just a basic electrical failure, uh, you know, that, that can be troubleshot without a laptop. But if you're having any kind of in-depth issues, you're plugging something into this machine and you've gotta know how to set up COM ports. That's not intimidating. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't be fearful of it. Learn it. It's, it's not as hard as it sounds. Uh, genuinely, I am a country hick from backwoods East Texas, and I have figured this stuff out. Pretty sure you can too. It just takes time. Anyway. Um, questions? Let's roll through some final questions before we close out. Uh, keep in mind, guys, I am only barely touching the surface on any of these concepts. Uh, and I want to preface that very heavily. Uh, nothing I have talked about tonight is in depth on any scale. Uh, and if it feels overwhelming, that's okay. When you get into this side of the work and this, these types of machines, it is a lot. And it is nothing like uh, just really anything else in the industry. I mean, you're in, there's a reason why, you know, it was a thing to become just a dedicated chiller tech. And that's the only thing you ever did in your career. Um, my personal opinion, I think that we've got to expand beyond that if the trade is to survive. Um, and not, not that it was wrong back then. I just don't think the market is sustainable for that now. Uh, I really like my own team. All of us need to be hybrid techs. We need, you need to work on chillers and you need to be able to work on an RTU and everything in between. Um, even RTUs, RTUs are, uh, Daikin is another prime example, uh, like their rebel series. Uh, they're running, uh, variable speed scrolls and they've got, it doesn't look like a, what we would think of a VFD. But there's a little, there's a small little green board uh, on the side of that unit, and that is the VFD for that system. Uh, it's got capacitor banks, it's got an internal inverter, it's got, it, it is a VFD, it just, it doesn't have an interface and it doesn't look like it's in a pretty case. Um, the uh, uh, Aon, Aon and a lot of those types of systems are putting actual VFDs on compressors. So uh, it's, it's, now's the time, guys. All right, let's see, we got some questions rolling in. Uh, 19XR, no, on the 19XRs, I don't. We had one, I don't know that that chiller is even still in existence, it may be. Uh, there, is, there is very, very little carrier centrifugal in our area. Uh, I think there used to be more than there is now, but yeah, I've, I've, it's not that much. Um, how to troubleshoot low charge on turbo core systems, common symptoms. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're going to have uh, high superheats. You're going to be running high on your guide vanes, even though you've got you know lower loads. Your approach value is going to be high. That's probably the biggest thing is you're going to start to see approach values run high and your superheat's going to run high. Uh, and, um, you know, when you see those two, those two readings, and you're, so not only is your suction superheat going to run high, your discharge superheat will run higher. 
Now the motor has its own dedicated cooling circuit. So that's going to kind of compensate a little bit on the discharge superheat, but those readings are all going to run. They're just going to run higher. Uh, the other side of that is those systems run EEVs. So you should have a legitimate subcooling uh, coming out of your condenser. And if you don't, then it's very likely you have a charge issue. Uh, you know, you, you should be able to produce uh, subcooling off of, off of the bottom of your condenser. So that'd be something to look for. Uh, how do the turbo core units compare to centrifugal chiller units? Uh, they've got their place. I, I genuinely, so I'm a huge fan of turbo core. Genuinely, I love them. I think they're great. They're not easy to learn, but they're a lot easier than a lot of others. Uh, at the same time, um, the I I think what York is doing with the YK is top notch. I think York is producing some incredible chillers right now. Not the trains, not, uh, but I do think York is is really they're putting some good stuff out. So I think it really depends on your app completely. Um, and that's what I do with customers. You know, I don't tell them one way or the other. We look at what their situation is, what their needs are, what efficiencies do they have to have, and what their serviceability needs are. And then we, we base everything from there. So it's, it's not, I don't, I don't think it's that simple of an answer, I guess is where I'm going with that. Uh, eventually I suspect everything will be OEM, train text, on train only. York on York only. Uh, yeah, and, and so they're trying to push that way. You know, we're seeing that in our area. You know, we're not a direct manufacturing rep. Uh, we just, we kind of work on everything. Uh, but yeah, we see that. We, we, we see Train and York especially are really cracking down on their markets uh, regarding you know, how do turbo core units compare so turbo cores themselves are beyond efficient. I mean, stupid levels of efficiency uh, for a compressor. It's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Uh, it's, yeah, the turbo core is oilless. When it's, if you hear the term mag bearing passed around, there is no oil in that system. Uh, they don't, they don't, they, yeah, you can't have oil in that. Daikin is the best. Yeah, I, I like what Daikin's doing too. Um, I really do. I think Daikin has some in, in really incredible machines coming into the market. Um, yeah, Daikin's good. How does York YK compare to YZ or YMC squared for large ton chillers in terms of efficiency? Uh, so the YK is good. It's good, it's fairly balanced. But um, genuinely, the YZ and the YMC, they're just, those two were built for robust efficiencies. Not that the YK is not. Uh, I think the YK and YZ would be fairly comparable. Uh, but, um, I mean, if you're going to spend the money, you're not going to go wrong with either of the three. Uh, yeah, we got the peanut gallery back there making noise. Uh, turbo core loses a internal sensor. Loose, loose a internal sensor. Loose a compressor. Uh, I mean, you can change a lot of those internal sensors on a turbo core. It depends on how far you're willing to dig into it. But there are some you you shouldn't. I mean, that is correct. Um, have you dealt with new CVH series? No, uh, and I haven't, I haven't seen any in the wild. Uh, I know that they are out there and exist. We've even quoted some to put in ourselves, but uh, no, I've not worked on the new series with the refrigerant. Uh, will manufacturing inconsistencies affect reliability with the complexity of the turbo core though? Uh, yes, they do. So for example, uh, smart in my opinion is not my favorite 
line of machines and their control systems. Um, while they work, they do work, uh, they, yeah, not a, not a fan, not a fan of their setup. And it's not turbo core that's the problem, in my opinion. Uh, the turbo core I've seen, uh, you have to connect via the laptop to have compressor data. Uh, do you use the Danfoss software or do you have it all on the, so yeah, it, uh, we use, use uh, so it's a uh, SMT service monitoring tool is the laptop tool for Danfoss uh, for the turbo core specifically. Um, but Daikin, Daikin doesn't give you all of the data that you can get from SMT, but it gives you a lot of it. And that's only with the new interface. Keep that in mind. That's with the new HMI. Uh, the original series that looked like something from the 90s didn't give you any of that stuff, or at least not near as in-depth. But the newer interface does, and, and Daikin made one hell of an interface when they did that. Uh, choo -choo -choo. Okay. <sighs> I've talked enough. Um, I'm going to talk with the team because I had another two pages. I got I got one page done. I had two more pages to cover for my stuff. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk to the team. We'll see about maybe tomorrow being a continuation, but that means then the next month would be the controls principle side of it. So, I have not gotten into how we load control, how we use the PRV assembly. I haven't gotten into any of that stuff. Uh, the safety parameters, I mean, nothing. There's that, that's an, at least a class, if not two of its own, which we knew that kind of going into this. There's, there's way too much to teach to do it properly, and I just struggle with not doing it somewhat proper. Uh, how to troubleshoot a liquid load? Oh, a uh, flooded evap. Um, so, I mean, so again, uh, Serling, that goes back to what type of machine, you know, if we're talking, uh, if we're talking like a York YK, for example, then it's liquid level uh, is, is on the condenser side and you're going to troubleshoot that with, um, uh, just the sight glass. You can, you can use the sight glass to, to compare what the sight glass installed on the uh, machine is doing to what the display is showing. And a lot of times what will happen is it, the, the sensor will read much higher or much lower. Just It'll be an extreme of one or the other um, compared to what the chiller is actually doing. So that's probably the easiest way with a York. Uh, I don't have... I can look back in the service books. I don't remember if York actually gives you a troubleshoot guide on the level sensors, but they will definitely tell you, don't play with them. Uh, if you, you can replace them and do that kind of stuff, but don't go beyond that. Uh, they're, they're finicky. York is very clear about that. If you ever go through their, their classes, um, the, uh, so if we're talking like a train liquid level sensor, a lot of the times those are on the evaporator side. Uh, so you could base that off of a couple of things, but the easiest would probably be just, so you can either get a clear uh, refrigerant hose and do a literal level check on the evaporator. So you would go from the bottom port of the evaporator to one of the top ports of the evaporator this is just like you were checking oil level on a separator or something. And that would be one way you can see the literal uh, liquid level of the refrigerant. An alternative would be, if, you know, say you didn't have a clear hose, which they do make, uh, but say you didn't have one, you could just go use your regular hoses and get a, a quarter inch sight glass from a parts house the, with the, the flared and, um, you know, you're just, you're going to run the hoses the same, but you can kind of move that sight glass up and down until you find the liquid level in the chiller and you have to do this slowly, but then you can actually get the, the actual liquid level line on that barrel. 
And if that doesn't comparably compare to what that sensor is registering, for example, if the level is way higher, but that sensor says it's down low somehow, you got a bad sensor. I'd, I'd probably be, I think that's, that's the uh, simplest. Uh, yeah. So what about York air-cooled flash tank level sensor? Um, well, if your economizer line is freezing over and your compressor is making really funny noises, it's very likely that that sensor has failed. Uh, for those who know what I'm referencing, that's, uh, sorry. Um, in, in reality, it's, uh, what I use is the frost, the, not frost, the uh, condensate line. So the condensate, the, the liquid refrigerant there down will condensate real heavily. And there'll be a literal clear, distinct line on that, uh, um, the housing of the flash tank that is indicating your actual level. So that's what I heavily use and base it off of is I'm, I'm seeing where that condensate line is and then I can compare that, you know, within reason to what the sensor says I'm at. And as long as I'm on the same football field, I'm usually pretty okay with it. Uh, the nightmare compressor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was a good one. You don't have those every day. All right, guys, I got to close this out. I'm going to go home. My kids are waiting on me. So hope you enjoyed it. See you all tomorrow evening. Eventually, it'll close. Eventually, just thinking about it. MTT, by the way, I didn't, I hadn't said that yet. If you can still hear me, having trouble. Can I please check? Oh, I'm connected just fine.